Hi, welcome to Literaturely, a podcast about teaching literature. I'm Margaret Monk. And I'm Paige Wallace. And today we are flipping things up <laughs> and talking about flipped classrooms. I wish you guys could see how proud of Margaret, like Margaret was of herself for that. <laughs> uh. You know, just uh, an improv student here applying what she's learned. That's a tip we have not ever, I've not ever discussed. Um, if you have never taught in a classroom before, I actually highly recommend teach, taking improv classes because it helps you think on your feet. Yeah, I, I kind of second that. I feel like that's a like very practical, fun way to prepare for a life of teaching. Yeah, because you have to be okay with looking silly sometimes in front of a crowd of people. A lot. Yeah, probably. A lot. (laughs) Especially when you're teaching on Zoom and you know your students are being like, ugh, my teacher is a millennial meme trying to navigate like, oh, I share my screen with you guys again. (laughs) Um, But back to the flipped classrooms, that's something kind of, I guess, with the Zoom, a lot of us having to are having to adapt our teaching styles during the pandemic and it's really made you and I think a lot about well what kind of approaches are out there that we haven't considered before yes so we have talked before about like a traditional literature class is really sort of discussion based at Mm -hmm. least I think you and I that's how we see it right yeah um and discussions can work in digital spaces um, but it's, it's almost like you've realized that they only work for like a limited time. Um, they get really it's hard old. to get into a flow. Yeah. Like they'll respond to another student like once or twice, but you're not really going to have that same sort of evolution of ideas unfold organically the way you do in the face-to-face setting, at least. I haven't been able to replicate that yet. (laughs) Yeah. So it could be us. It could just be us. But um, I have a suspicion that maybe it's not. And Mm. so part of why we're talking about the flipped classroom in in a literature setting is to think about ways to dress up discussions um, to help get some of those dynamics happening either either on like a in a digital space but also sometimes you just have a class where discussions fall flat often I feel like yeah it's just kind of thinking of ways that we can adapt our class for changing situations that are outside of our control um but also just thinking more consciously about the way we teach so it's not just well this is the way it's always been done so this is the way I'll do it um not saying that flipped classrooms are going to be a better fit for everyone but we should explore this option and think well what what are the benefits of this yeah and so let's talk about like our goals for this kind of classroom model Margaret Mm -hmm. okay cool um should we first kind of make sure everyone knows what we mean when we say flipped classroom I know that that's a term I only relatively recently. Yeah, I think that that's probably a good place to start. Yes. So flipped classrooms, as we've been alluding to, like traditional classroom settings, it's students do the reading at home, and then you have the lecture discussion in the classroom. And flipped classrooms, flip that. (laughs) So um, students will access the lectures at home. um, And in class, you have more application. um, Yeah. And I think even in this model, I would do discussions at home. So like in terms of like the lecture plus a discussion blog or on Twitter or wherever, so that both of those are happening at home. And then we're coming in and doing some sort of like active learning component. Yeah. I think it's really nice where it allows for that individual development and processing to happen in an individual space and then for that sort of communal learning to happen in the communal space um which we'll get more into um as we talk about today so Paige what are some of your goals for a flipped classroom yeah so I think my biggest goal is to kind of revisit my role 
as the instructor, the professor, um, as not the sort of sage <laughs> sage, <clears throat> but as the guide on the side. And we've talked about that a little bit, right? So kind of taking um, the focus off of me as being the person of ha to have all the answers and instead sort of put it on the students to figure it out to a little bit. I like that because I think it encourages students to, as you're saying, take a more active role in their learning, um, that it's not just being those sponges absorbing the information of you tell me what to think and then I'll perform it for you, which that's one of the primary goals of literary class or literature class is to help our students develop their critical thinking skills. And if we're just telling them, this is what it is, this is what this means, where's the critical thinking in that? And that's the thing we see so much with like students, especially freshmen, sophomore students, where they say to you, well, what should I write about? What should my thesis be? What should I think about this, right? And, and so I think Flip Classroom has the potential to kind of set them up to understand that like, I don't have the answer for you, right? Um, you have to go on this journey to figure out the answer. And I think that's a really good note to make is that it also, I think, can position learning as a journey because when you do all the lectures, all the discussions in your 50 minute, 75 minute class, you're on a time limit. You're expecting your students to absorb and process this information all in the same amount of time and different students have different brains which process differently so when you're introducing these concepts at home it's allowing the students to be self-paced and have more control over that journey um so they can process the, the material the way at their own speed um and i know you and i have have experimented with different ways of doing this we've written lectures we've recorded lectures so thinking like they can reread they can rewind without taking that leap to raise their hand and say in front of everyone, I don't understand that. Can you repeat that? Or, um, I think you're right about that. And it also the potential of them being able to revisit the lecture or even like go over the lecture before they complete the, that assigned reading, I think acts to as sort of like the lecture working as like a guide for them, um, for how to approach what they're about to read. And, and that works that way, I think, in a classroom setting too, right? Um, but almost, it gives them permission to sit down with the lecture and the assigned reading together um, and say, you know, okay, what do I need to understand in order to start being able to open this text up more? Yeah. And it can make some of that sort of logistics easier when you can tell your students like review that lecture as you're working on this or or go back take a look at what we talked about here it makes it much more of a resource versus when you're sharing it in class and they're like taking notes and trying to transcribe everything you say as you say it it does like you were saying before put you in that position of the stage on the stage versus someone who's sharing knowledge and giving them the time and space to think about what you're saying, question what you're saying, respond to it. Um, something that helps me with this is I use Twitter in, in my classes. So I'll put in hashtags in the lectures throughout um, to tell my students, like, do you have questions about this? Do you have thoughts? Do you see this connecting to things? If so, tweet them out now with that this hashtag. And it's optional. Um, I have certain like minimum requirements for how many times they tweet a week and whatnot, but it's helpful because they feel more comfortable asking on Twitter because it doesn't feel like they're putting themselves on blast for not knowing something. Right. Um, and I also encourage them to think about it. Like you might not necessarily have a question, but also just take the time to think if you could see a student in general having that question. And if you can go ahead and ask that, take one for the team, help your fellow classmates out. Um, you can do the approach of, my friend was wondering. <laughs> um, yeah. But and also, I think that for me, I am, I was always and still am the kind of like 
learner that I need to take time to a sense of like process, right? Like, um, and to be able to go through a lecture prior to class gives, would I imagine would give me time to figure out what questions I do have Mm -hmm. versus like you said, like, like frantically taking notes and trying to think it through in the moment just maybe isn't enough time sometimes. Yeah, I've actually, so I don't flip all of my classes. Like it really is kind of a case by case as we've discussed, but something I have incorporated now into every class I teach is the assignments are always homework. And by that, I mean, like when I, instead of going over a project in class and the requirements and what the expectations are, what's due, the assignment sheet itself is their homework reading. And that way they come in with exactly what you're saying of having those questions thought through. And they actually ask questions versus when I would go over it at the beginning of class and just say, does anyone have any questions? The answer is always no, because they can't have questions at that point. They just found out what they're doing. Right. Um, So I think giving them that time to really process, you're going to get more thoughtful questions and you're also going to start seeing them think things through, making their own applications. Um, And that way you get more thoughtful explorations during class time together. Because by having that individual processing at home, you can have some more like cooperative learning during class time where they're filling in the gaps for one another, showing their different perspectives of like, oh, well, I was seeing it this way. Um, and so group work isn't them trying to figure out like, what was she saying? Like, what what are we reading? <laughs> right. but- Absolutely. So like, let's talk through some of the kind of activities that we would use in a flipped classroom. Yeah, so I think um, just to start with the logistics, you, I think you'd probably need to have some more quizzes um, built in that might not necessarily be during class time, but just for this sort of accountability. Because mm-hmm. um, obviously we're in a pandemic right now, so everyone's a little bit more scattered to begin with, but um students do have the tendency to see work that they do as at home as homework and homework as optional so you do run the risk of your students not reading the lectures not reading the materials and then coming to class expecting that it's just the class time that's important um so you might want some sort of accountability just to have make that incentive to make sure they're doing it. And I wouldn't have it be difficult, but you're not trying to trick them up. It's just, Hey, this does matter to make that clear to them. Um, And I think you can have this be at home and open book. Like you don't need to police it or anything, as long as they can answer the questions. Right. (laughs) They've done it. Um, But you do want some sort of incentive to make sure they're coming to class with that information. Cause otherwise they've lost all of the structure for the course. Margaret, this made me think, do you do reading quizzes in your lit classes? Uh, I do sometimes. I do it in my classes and that's mostly um, to give them cushion. Like first for non-English majors who just are really uncomfortable with analysis, writing, I do the objective quizzes to help reward. It's basically a reward for the work they are doing and to help kind of encourage them that, and it doesn't make them feel totally overwhelmed. It, it's kind of that familiar territory, but I don't try to trick people up with the quizzes. It's pretty straightforward. Um, one of the things I do in my quizzes though, is I ask them who wrote the story and when did they write it? Cause that's something we talk about in class and otherwise they don't pay attention <laughs> to that information. Um, in my upper levels, I don't do quizzes really because they're, they're more comfortable with the rest of the work. So yeah. I like that. I like your approach to quizzes. Um, I know it's not what we're really talking about today, but I like that it, that you immediately said like, it was a way to reward students for the work they're doing versus like to police whether or not they're doing the work. Um, 
Like, I like that approach to it. <clears throat> yeah, like, I know that you ha- a lot of students will take an intro literature course to fulfill a humanities requirement. And a lot of times they really feel out of their element. Um, so you just have to figure out where your students are, which I think is also the same thing with the flipped classroom. Uh, this is all about meeting students where they are. And so your students may need different things different structures and and I think you have to be kind of open to adapting as needed you and I have been talking about this semester maybe having to adapt the way we're, we've been doing the flipped classroom because pandemics make learning harder <laughs> than usual so I bear that in mind what are some other activities you'd incorporate for um so I really like um the idea of like discovery packets Oh, what's the discovery packet? A little bit already, um, where you give students a a folder, and this could be done digitally with like a Google folder, um, a folder of documents. And I think you could even incorporate like passages that you wanted them to close read or focus on Mm -hmm. with historical documents or things from archives that are available or um, even, you know, like booktube has like so many cool interesting voices and and videos um and so what I do is try and give a packet of information that like impacts like how they're reading a particular section or passage um and then and like the idea is to take your packet of information, take your source, like is, which is the reading that we're working on, right? So that passage from it, annotate it, break it down. What do you think, you know, the takeaways are, so on and so forth from what you know with the lecture and whatever discussion we've done. And then take all of the information, determine like, you know, what is it? Where did it come from, right? So questions like, you know, who authored it? Why does that matter? Um, so on and so forth, and then reflect on how having all of this information um, changes or impacts your reading of the text. And sometimes that's like negatively or the idea that reading within any vacuum can impact like the way you see a text and then come together. Like, so usually each packet has the same passage, but but Mm -hmm. different uh, um, supporting documents. So like how did each of the groups differ and what they what they got at the end? That sounds so cool. Like I just keep thinking when you're talking about how that really seems to embody the guide on the side. Like you're scaffolding the assignment so that way the students are developing the skill sets necessary for this work, but then they're teaching each other during the class time. And that's, I, I don't know. I just really love that you're giving your students your that ability to kind of share that information and take on that role of the expert, but you're not just throwing them into the deep end and be like, I don't know, swim. <laughs> <laughs> I love discovery packets. I think they're so fun. Um, I have not used them as much in this digital world. Would because- you be willing to share any of them on our? Yeah, actually, I have one. Um, that's about source materials. Um, that's probably my, my most developed one. I use it in comp. So how do we evaluate sources? But I think it also could work for a, like like at the beginning of lit classes, right? Like yeah. sources, so on and so forth. And then I also have one that's about, um, that's from a passage from The Roundhouse by Louise Eldrick. And like, it's thinking about uh, uh, justice and, law and like the fact that laws are not always representative of justice and extrajudicial justice and stuff like that and so I could share both of those I think that would be so cool because I know personally I want to see these because I've never used discovery packets and I think it would be such a useful way to flip a classroom where you're allowing them like we've been talking about to process that information on their own and then use class time to work together to practice these skills, use their classmates' strengths to their advantage, and and then share that information and really start getting comfortable taking on that role of the interpreter. Because 
to me, that's one of the hardest things about teaching literature is that at the end of the day, your students will, you'll spend a whole class with your students analyzing a text. And then towards the end, one of them will raise their hand and say, so what do you think? What's, what's the right interpretation? And it's like, I mean, it's it's hard too, because you do have like, you have your own interpretation. Mm -hmm. And so it is hard to not push them towards that. And so that's why I like discovery packets, because it's really, it's, it's, in a lot of ways, it's hands off for me. I get to go around and listen to the ideas that they have um, without needing to interject so much because the whole idea is that you have to kind of like make connections, break down like, why did she give us this document? What does it have to do with anything? That I'm, I'm going to steal that assignment from you in the future. <laughs> you were also- I'm, like, I'm sure I stole it from someone else, so- <laughs> Well, and you were also talking about annotations. It was making me think of something I'm really excited for with flipping literature classrooms of being able to do what we talked about in the previous episodes of group projects mm-hmm. of um, if you have like a group project focused class where you're creating like that um, online annotated copy of, of a text together as a class, like that's what your class time is for. So at home, you have the lectures and readings where you're giving them the necessary background information. You're giving them the strategies um, for building these sorts of skill sets. You're giving them additional readings, like all of that. And then in class time, they're actually working with one another to put into effect, like what you've been discussing. And so it's the same thing of letting them work together that you can have that one-on-one relationship with your students through your readings at home, but class time is the only time all of your students are going to be in the same sort of time place to work together and get each other's perspectives. So Margaret, I want you to talk through how you approach annotations in terms of like, what are they? Because I have a lot of students that when I say annotate a text, they think like they go back to like AP English Mm -hmm. class and they're like, here's a simile. This is imagery. And and so how do the kind of annotations that I think you're talking about um, differ from the, from that, like what they're used to? So I do have that to an extent because again, I want to come to them where they are, Um, but they have to take those a step further where it's, explain to me why the simile is important, like identify the simile, but then explain why we care about the simile. Um, and so I'm, I'm pulling up kind of exactly what I've done in the past. So I see annotations as developing the skill sets to do close reading and interpretation, but also start developing their abilities to research and put other texts into conversation with this. So in the past, when I've done annotation assignments, um, they I've required that they have the analytical comments or identify the techniques and explain why they're important or pick like a sentence or two and do like a quick close reading of a very very small passage like if you can interpret like hey this is the metaphor happening in this sentence or anything like that but they also have to have annotations that reference like a peer-reviewed article or another work of art or another text or someone else's interpretation of that passage or whatever so that way they're both analyzing the text themselves in the way they're familiar with of like, this is a simile, this is characterization, this is a symbol, Um, but also starting to put it into conversation with other people's perspectives. And again, when they identify the metaphor, symbol, characterization, they have to explain, and this is why it's important. They just can't point at it. Um, So I I include like word minimums for the annotations. Um, they, They tend to be like somewhere between Mm, like 75 to 250 words, depending on the assignment and the types of annotations. Um, So they are like short paragraphs. And we sometimes do them individually. But I think if you're doing a flipped classroom, you'd do it in small groups and you'd give your different groups a theme and allow them to like talk through. So I've done things like where students have to 
in the same work, like one group will be looking at the way masculinity is depicted. One group's looking at the way femininity is depicted. Some, one group's looking at the way like class works, et cetera. And so what you were saying with the discovery packets, they're all looking through these different lenses at the same passage or same work but they're asking different questions. And so then as a class, we can talk about it all. And, and they're like, oh, like we were just focused like on this thing, but this actually connects. And that's the really nice thing is they start making connections. Like, okay, well, if masculinity is being depicted this way and class is being depicted this way, here's the overlap, um, which I'm not telling them that's the overlap. They're, they're realizing that where they're like, oh, we looked at that same sentence and this is how we saw it. Um, and so there's also, we haven't talked about this, but there's more pride in it when, when, when they're doing that. They're take, they're, because they're working through it themselves, there's more emotional investment that there's a personal payoff for them. Um, it's right. not just like, oh, my teacher says this. And so in the past, I'm assuming you've done like hard copies of annotations? No, I've actually always done them digital. Ooh, so I do them via Wix. Yeah. And which <laughs> the drawback is, um, it means I am typing up these passages myself a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. So there is some front load of work, uh, which is just part of the flipped classroom in general, which to make clear to everyone at home, flipped classrooms do require a lot more upfront work because you can't just riff in class. Um, but I also, if I can like find, you know, other online versions, that's a nice thing of just copying and pasting. <laughs> but like when I, we um, annotated the Odyssey for a class and for whatever reason, I had to type up the passages for that, that they were working with. Um, but I, I use Wix. So in the first week of the semester, they set up their Wix pages. And then in class, they can go to my site where I've typed up the passage we're using. They copy and paste it to theirs. And then when they're annotating, they um, hyperlink to footnotes or they can do like pop-up boxes. We, uh -huh. we actually have a, a conversation in class with that, which in the flipped classroom would be a lecture, <laughs> but of um, how much room do you want your annotations to take up with a text? Like are, are, are the annotations supposed to be apart from it? Are they supposed to be guiding other readers? And like, what are the ethics of putting your, your own perspective onto this work? Um, and so we have that conversation in the beginning when we're talking about interpretation, research, all of that. Um, so it's, it's a much larger conversation, but Wix, it's really easy to do that sort of digital work without your students knowing programming or anything. Yeah, I love that. I think that's something that you should definitely share as well. Which maybe that will be my first blog post for the literature, literally blog we are just launching. Yes. But yeah, I'm, I'm really, it's an assignment that I really like and students respond to well because they, they see themselves building a real life quote in quotations, real life skill set for um, being able to format a website. So they're more willing to do that work. And so even students who, the more reluctant students um, get involved. But if I was doing the flipped classroom and doing that sort of as a semester long project, Obviously, that's going to be a good use to me of class time in a collaborative where you can check in with the groups, give them their feedback, give them advice, help them um, with those skills, but also let them collaborate without expecting your students to have to schedule time. Like, I think now more than ever, students are working while putting themselves through school. Um, students have labs. I just think if you're going to have group projects, and I'm guilty of this all the time so guilty of being like oh yeah by the time you all can work together yeah it's just not really maybe the most compassionate approach to yeah program. I agree with you I think that giving them the chance to work on things in class is definitely the way to go with with group projects yeah, yeah. so flipped classrooms are great for that if you are someone who likes group projects I think flipped classrooms are kind of something you should consider yeah um, I I think the other thing that I would um, really try and focus on in a flipped classroom would be like student-led classes mm. and maybe giving them a, like some scaffolding. Cause like I've done students lead discussion, right? They come in with like mm. a series of discussion questions, 
but I think if I was asking a, a group of students to lead class for the entire, you know, hour and 15 or even 50 minutes, then I would give them more scaffolding. Like, I don't know what it would look like. It would be something like discuss, connect, um, something, right? Like it, it, it yeah. would have to be something, something else. And it might even be giving them like, I was just thinking about this, like a list um, or a folder full of like potential like activities um, and giving them the option, like that group of students, it wouldn't be a single student in this mm-hmm. case, but like whatever group you're working with, um, letting them choose the activity for the day. And mm-hmm. so like they set up the discussion at the beginning and then they choose the activity. I think I would still, like I would still, work with them on that activity because I feel like again that might be a little too much to have them like figure out the execution of the activity from start to finish but that idea of collaborating with them on an activity that they think would be useful for the rest of their classmates that's you know something they're choosing could be cool yeah I think that sounds really interesting to me and thinking that a lot of universities are now it seems like including classes that are like how to teach high school literature like a lot of my students are people who want to teach high school English and so I think that's also useful for thinking about well what are your students going to do with your course well if they're going to be teaching maybe incorporate those sorts of lessons where they're learning how to teach this themselves it's kind of like that that professional development like I know that university shouldn't only be about professional development but it should be about helping them hone the skill sets that will be useful um I was also thinking through this is maybe the exception to what we've been talking about with like the guide on the side versus the sage on the stage but we've mentioned this before reading critical theory is not a skill set easily learned and my experience as a student was always just reading theory at home and I'd read these like dense essays, chapters, whatever, and just be like, I don't know what this means. What's happening? So you just feel dumb. And then you go into the classroom and your professor says, well, it means this, obviously. And you're like, oh, I didn't know it was obvious, but <laughs> okay. And they go through it. And I don't know, my, my memory is always just feeling awed and impressed by my professor for being able to understand this but also feeling like, well, I just guess I don't get theory. I just don't understand this. And in hindsight, I look at it and think, well, no one ever taught me how to read theory. They were teaching me how to read novels, teaching me how to read poetry and drama, but no one taught me how to read theory. And like, this is what this sort of terminology means. This is how we're structuring it. This is what makes a good critical theory essay. And this is what makes a bad one. Um, So I think a flipped classroom, one of the things I'd like to try with it is introducing the theoretical concept and context at home, like, like giving them an overview of like, this is what a Marxist reading is. This is what a formalist reading, whatever. But then we actually read the essay together in class where you can break it down like paragraph by paragraph and, and help them develop the skills of like, this is how you read it. This is how you read theory. And make it clear to them that this is an interactive reading, like ask questions <laughs> when we're going through, ask questions, respond to it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that that's a great idea. I think it's something that you would want to do like, you know, on Mondays, we're going to read the theory together mm-hmm. and then every other day is going to be something different. But I definitely think that's a way that you could approach it as long as you did, as long as it wasn't like overkill with it. <laughs> Yeah, I, w- it's, I wouldn't do it as an everyday activity. So I don't know what I would do if I was doing a flipped theory class, but I, this is something I would do like in a women in literature c- class or a short story class where we're using those theoretical frameworks, but they're not necessarily the primary focus. But that way you're helping your students develop that sort of those reading skills. And when they're doing the research later on, they can actually read the research because otherwise that's why you just get students like cherry picking quotes from their critical essays and being like there you go yeah but I think maybe main takeaway 
is there's a lot we can do with the flipped classroom. I feel like we're scratching the surface. And as we've been talking about, you just have to adapt it for your course, for your students, for larger world circumstances. <laughs> I think you're right. And I think like a thing that we should note is that we couldn't find a lot of research on flip classrooms is like specifically literature classrooms. Yeah. And I there's think- a lot for STEM, a lot for English as a second language, but not for literature. Yeah. And I think there's this sense that the flip classroom in literature is just you doing the lecture at home and then coming in and reading the text. Mm-hmm. And I think that there's a way that maybe you could give them time to read in class, like silently. Like, I don't think that that's a terrible idea sometimes, but it, again, it would be something that would need to be like, a, like you know, like in elementary school where you read for 20 minutes, you know, sure, maybe you could incorporate something like that, but that's not all that you would need to do, right? The potential for the flip class would have to be in doing, like having that active learning space where you're doing stuff, but where the students are doing stuff and they, and it's tangible to them that like, that they're walking through a set of like, I don't know, like task that get them somewhere. Yeah. So like, it's not going to work for every type of literature class or every type of student group, but it can work. And it really, I think, can let us reconsider what role we occupy in the classroom as, as instructors, professors, but also our students. Like they're not just there to sit and regurgitate what we say during the lectures. They're there to be exposed to these perspectives, these different contexts and start to make the connections themselves. And so I don't think, yeah, I don't think I'm going to use the flipped classroom for every class I teach, but I definitely want to incorporate it for more courses moving forwards. Yeah. And, and also I think that the, it doesn't always have to be a semester long endeavor, Mm -hmm. right? It could be what you do for one unit or what you do, twice every book or what right like it can work however you need it to yeah I think that's a really good point so just all about flexibility which yeah I want to look towards the future with you Paige and and ask you what's your dream course today my dream course today is like um thinking about literature like anthrop and the anthropocene and feminism So there's an edited collection um, by Richard Grusson. I don't know if I'm saying his last name right. So, Um, but it's called uh, Anthropocene Feminism. Um, And so it's thinking about how uh, feminism and queer theory impact the way we think about the Anthropocene. Um, and so my goal would be to talk students through, um, what we mean when we say the Anthropocene, how it's, um, like came about that term, um, and then how thinking about it through a feminist lens specifically will, like, could change the way we're thinking about, um, like eco-critical issues and environmental issues. Um, I'm trying to be really good about not choosing books first, um, figuring (laughs) out what I want, like my course objectives to be. Um, And so I was thinking about, I mean, it would be a lot of like apocalyptic fiction, I think. That makes sense. Yeah, and so, but I was thinking, you know, you had us read Dread Nation for book club, and I've been thinking a lot about it, and I think that that could be a conversation, an entryway into thinking about feminism and the Anthropocene and zombies and um, all these sort of intersections between when your environment is sort of not safe um, and how that is never just happening, you know, outside of like all the sort of social um, kind of pressures and issues. But also I'm just like leaning so heavily on the book club right now, but I'm also (laughs) interested. I'm, we're reading um, Axioms In by, is that Lindsay Ellis? Is that her last name? Yeah. I think so, Um, yeah. And I'm wondering where that's going to go. And if it would be, 
a potential text for this class, but that's my dream course right now. My very not fleshed out dream course. But that sounds really cool. I can see a lot of students wanting to take that. I want to take it. <laughs> so let me know when you teach it and I'll, I'll, um, oh my gosh, what is it called when you audit, 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 audit. <laughs> yeah. Well, you actually inspired my dream class earlier today um, in this conversation when you were talking about issues of justice, because it reminded me that that's one of my favorite things to have students consider is the way language forms our understanding of justice, like who is deserving of justice, what we consider to be acts of justice, um, what we see as an absence of justice, like, and, and really what, how language plays into all of that. And so I think I'd like to teach a course on literary and linguistic justice. I don't, I don't think it would be linguistics in the traditional sense, mm -hmm. but, um, and I'd get to teach Gregadora, <laughs> but, um, but a lot of us. <laughs> but I would like, so my goal of this would, would be for them to see the way language shapes cultural understandings of justice. And so I'd want um, different texts to respond to different types of justice. And that's one of the reasons I would include Corrigadora is to think about reproductive justices, that pluralization, that there's not just one reproductive justice. Um, and I was, And just kind of working through um, how language, as language evolves, so do our legal language, legalese, and so what it allows and pro prohibits, etc. cetera. Um, and I'd kind of just do a 20th century American fiction class with it. Yeah. Tweet us at literaturely101 if you are also interested <laughs> in this. And also, while we're talking about what y'all can do at home, if you are interested, please remember that we have our first literature, literaturely book club happening at the end of this season. We'll be recording it in uh, a few weeks. Um, so you feel free to start sending in your questions, your reactions, any of your thoughts to our um, email, literaturelypodcast at gmail.com, or feel free to tweet us, DM us on Instagram, whatever's easiest for you. Um, we're reading the edited collection of approaches to teaching Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale and other texts. <laughs> um, the editor for that collection is, um, I'm pulling it up right now. So it is edited by Sharon R. Wilson, Thomas B. Friedman, and Shannon Hengen. And it's on our Instagram, the information, so you can check it out there as well. But we're really excited. Paige and I have been book clubbing all kind of spring. We are ready to all book club with pandemic. you all at home. We've been <laughs> book clubbing all pandemic. Like we're never stopping. It's, it's here to yeah. at this point. And I think this is the first pedagogy book we're, we're going to be book clubbing so I'm really excited to see what everyone has to think um we'd love to shout you you all out at home and kind of make this a more community endeavor yeah and so um feel free to start sending us in your thoughts now check it out on Instagram for reminders and we'll see you at our next one yeah bye bye <laughs>